Canadian is joining Marie Curie and Albert Einstein in the pantheon of Nobel Prize winners for physics. She, Donna Strickland, is in even rarer company. The University of Waterloo engineer, professor and researcher is only the third woman scientist ever to win the physics prize. Here is Professor Strickland speaking in an interview from a couple of years ago about what inspired her to go into physics. My dad took me to the Science Center when I was five years old and said the lasers are the way of the future because I was born about the same time as the laser. But I don't actually remember that. So when I was looking for universities and where to go, McMaster University had a program in engineering physics and part of that was lasers and electro-optics. And I just thought, that sounds neat. I'm going to go there and do that. And she's done it to the absolute top in her field. Professor Strickland, as she spoke about her path, McMaster, Waterloo, born in Guelph, Ontario. Thomas Dagg is in London with more on the breaking news we got from the Nobel Committee this morning, Thomas. Yeah, and Heather, I have the paper here from 1985 for which uh, Professor Strickland has been honored today uh, with this uh, Nobel Prize. This is three pages long. In terms of physics, that's not very long. There's uh, some graphs in there, even I can almost understand it. It's about chirped pulse amplification, technology that allows a short laser pulse to be stretched and amplified, and this is, is used nowadays in vision correction surgery. Uh, she is a professor at uh, the University of Waterloo, but the work that she's being honored for now is from 1985. It's from the time she was a PhD student at the University of Rochester, New York, working with uh, Professor Gérard Mourou, uh, who Strickland describes as a mentor. He, too, is being honored today. His name is also on this work from the 80s. In all, three scientists are going to be splitting the prize today worth uh, almost $1.3 million. Beyond that, of course, they will all now have the title of Nobel Physics Prize Laureate, and there is, of course, no bigger honor for them in that world than that prize, Heather. There is not indeed. Noticing that uh, the University of Waterloo now tweeting its congratulations and joining in messages of congratulations from people all around the world, in fact. She got the phone call, Thomas, that scientists can only dream of. And we heard from her as part of the news conference this morning, her reaction to getting that call. Tell us more about that. Yeah, her reaction initially was to think this is crazy and is this for real? The phone call came from the Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences at about 5.20 this morning, her time in Ontario. Um, and she was asked a little bit later when it came to questions from journalists over the phone how it felt to only be the third woman to receive this prize. She didn't know, but here was her answer. We need to celebrate uh, women physicists because we're out there um, and hopefully uh, in this time it'll start to move forward at a faster rate maybe. I don't know what to say. Um, I'm honored to be one of those women. This is being seen by so many people in that field as a victory for women in physics. Uh, it's been pointed out that Professor Strickland didn't even have a Wikipedia page, despite making this um, terrific uh, discovery back in the 80s. Didn't even have a Wikipedia page until today, when it was created to point out that, yes, she is now a Nobel Physics Prize laureate. Um, just quite an honor, and uh, I'm sure she'll have plenty to say in the coming days and then when she uh, comes to Europe to receive that prize, Heather. Indeed. Oh, yes, we'll be covering that for sure. Thomas, thank you so much. Beginning our coverage there. Let's talk a little bit more about this, though, the science behind the discovery. Emily Chung is with me. She covers science and technology for us at CBC News, and thanks for coming in. So Thomas was telling us about the name, chirped pulse amplification, high-intensity, short laser pulses. Why was this such a big deal in 1985? Well, it was a big deal because um, up until then, it was very difficult for them to make intense laser pulses. Um, you can do that by amplifying the laser pulse, but what they found was when they put the laser pulse in, in the amplifier and they amplified it, it would blow up the amplifier. Um, the only way around this was to make really huge lasers, and that was really expensive and impractical. So um, what Strickland and uh, her team did was they stretched out the pulses um, before they went into the amplifier so they weren't as intense. 
and that would um, allow them to be amplified in the amplifier. And then what okay, they would look at do this graphic and tell us here. Can, can we help us understand what we're seeing there? So they stretch them out there. Yeah, they stretch them out before going into the amplifier. Uh, and that reduced the peak power so it wouldn't damage the amplifier. And then what they did was after it went out of the amplifier, much bigger than before, they would compress it again to get this really intense short pulse. Oh. That's just, just amazing that they can, I'm always so incredibly impressed by how they could ever conceive of something like that. So they stretched them out, then they made them bigger, and then they made them shorter. And then what we know is that whole science led to multiple industrial and uh, medical applications, notably laser eye surgery. That's right, that's right. And a lot of people use that now to treat nearsightedness so they don't have to wear glasses like me. Um, <laughs> how does it work there? How does it apply there? Well, um, you want, in order to make really precise cutting, you, you use the laser. Um, the problem with lasers, of course, is they generate a lot of heat. And um, heat can damage your cells, and, and you wouldn't want to, to damage anyone's no. eyesight for, for laser surgery. So um, with these really, really short pulses, um, because they're so short, the amount of heat that's generated is, is quite small. And so they can do really precise cutting um, without causing any damage. And that's been proven over the long term, isn't it? I remember there were questions about how it would work and when it was first devised, but uh, it seems to be just incredibly safe and incredibly popular yeah. now. I know so, tons of people who've had Absolutely, as do I. So <laughs> listen, you'll be writing a lot on this today, I know. Thank you, Emily, for giving me some time today. One of our science and technology writers for CBC News, Emily Chung. And we'll